This episode is brought to you by Avalanche and Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Enjoy. Our goal, you know, since we were created, has always been to become like the biggest crypto exchange. All right, everyone. Another special episode. Uh, although I, I feel like I'm getting in trouble these days because I'm saying that for every episode. Uh, we are here with uh, Antonio. Uh, Antonio is one of the founders or the founder of DYDX. Uh, DYDX, we'll get into it in a second, but on a mission to build the world's largest uh, crypto exchange. A lot of you have probably heard of things like uh, Coinbase and Binance and FTX. Uh, the thing that separates DYDX from a lot of these is they are decentralized. So we're going to get into what that actually means, uh, talk about some interesting thoughts that Antonio had on uh, different L1s and a whole bunch of different things. But first things first, Antonio, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, excited to have you here. Um, Antonio, you have this amazing tweet uh, that you sent out in September. You, uh, you said, five years ago, I left Coinbase and eventually founded DYDX. Today, for the first time, DYDX is doing more trade volume than Coinbase. How crazy was this of a feeling? I mean, you leave Coinbase in, in 2015, 2016, and now you launch this you know, obviously small little startup, DYDX, and, and one day it passes Coinbase. How did this feel? It felt really awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think this is what I was always excited about with the potential of decentralized applications. When I started DYDX over four years ago now, um, this was always the goal, right? But anytime you start a startup, like, you know, you think that it's possible to hit your goal, but it's certainly not a given. So it felt really good and rewarding to kind of get there. I still think we have a ton of exciting things going on with DYDX and a ton of ways to go still to kind of reach our long-term goal of, as you say, becoming the biggest exchange in crypto, but it was a really rewarding milestone for myself and I think the rest of the team as well. Nice. For uh, for those who are unfamiliar with DEXs, um, I mean, I can give a really high level, like DYDX is very different than Coinbase. Coinbase is mainly a spot exchange. DYDX focuses on like perps and futures, but can you compare how something like uh, from the lens of like, what is a DEX? Like how does something like DYDX compare to maybe an FTX or a Binance? Yeah, absolutely. So the main way we're different than an FTX or a Binance, where as you say, a decentralized exchange, what that means is we're built on top of smart contracts. Smart contracts, probably as most listeners know, are kind of just a fancy word for programs that run directly on the blockchain. So we can build these programs, code all the rules of our derivative contracts, right? Like how does collateralization work? How does trading work? Uh, how do liquidations work, etc.? Um, we can deploy these programs to the blockchain. They just live on the blockchain totally autonomously. Um, and then our users can interact with these programs directly on the blockchain. That is, we think, a pretty big improvement over what uh, is possible on centralized exchanges for a couple different reasons. First of all, it's just very secure to trade on a decentralized exchange um, as long as the smart contract doesn't have any bugs or issues, um, which is something we do a lot of really rigorous security testing around. Um, the security really comes down to the security of each user's wallet rather than on centralized exchanges, the security you're really trusting your funds to be custodied by that exchange, right? Um, and these exchanges are holding usually billions or more dollars worth of cryptocurrency. So there's just a really huge incentive to hack them. Um, whereas on a decentralized exchange, like I was saying, everybody can custody their own coins. It also is a huge improvement in transparency. Kind of what I was just saying before, where we can literally code all the rules of the exchange into these smart contracts, get these smart contracts open sourced, get them audited, get them verified by third parties. And it's just a really effective way for us to bootstrap trust on the system because kind of for the first time in financial history, we're not sitting here saying, hey, trust us. We promise not to steal your money or screw you over. Um, instead, it's just like, look at the code that's running on the blockchain um, and trust the code. Don't trust us. A lot of trading in crypto is primarily spot. Like I remember, I, I think it was like 2019, I think it was, is like people started talking about futures and, or maybe 2017, obviously, like with CME coming into the scene. Uh, and then, it, you know, through the bear market, people were like, futures are coming, futures are coming and things like that. Uh, and now, and now it feels like futures are here, right? And, and you guys have really uh, had an amazing, amazing year, just raised a whole bunch of money. Can you just tell us like, I think futures and crypto are, I mean, we're, it, it are, it's early days, but like, what do perps and futures look like in the traditional world? Like, why is this an exciting market for you guys to go after? Why didn't you just build something like another Uniswap, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, DYDX was kind of founded over four years ago. And at that point in time, as you kind of alluded to, derivatives were not that big in crypto compared with the spot market. Um, the kind of exciting thing that was going on in the crypto markets four years ago was kind of the uh, really big proliferation of margin trading, um, specifically on exchanges like Bitfinex. Um, I remember when I was working at Coinbase, Coinbase was, you know, at that time, like the biggest exchange in the world by volume. And then we were really quickly passed by Bitfinex because Bitfinex was offering this new thing called margin trading. Fast forward a couple more years, um, and now the biggest product traded in crypto um, out of anything is a product called Perpetual Futures. It was popularized by BitMEX, and now Binance and FTX are the largest markets. Um, in terms of how it compares to the traditional financial markets, obviously derivatives are huge in the traditional financial markets as well. But in my opinion, there's kind of two uh, main things that are different about the crypto markets um, than the traditional financial markets. First of all, the product that has become really popular is different, right? Like perpetual futures aren't nearly as big in the traditional financial markets as they are in crypto. And I think the main reason for that is the crypto market is really kind of dominated by individual traders, whereas like the traditional financial markets are obviously pretty dominated by Wall Street funds. Um, there's certainly a lot of really legitimate trading funds in crypto as well. Um, but if you're an exchange in crypto, kind of the main thing that you have to focus on is individual traders. And then, of course, a lot of the institutions will push volume as well, but they kind of follow the individual traders around rather than vice versa. And that has, I think, led to um, the proliferation of perpetual futures, um, which are a really approachable product um, for all types of traders, at least all types of sophisticated traders to trade, because you don't have to deal with things like uh, sorry, expiration, um, it's relatively simple, it kind of feels like you're buying like the spot af asset with a good amount of leverage. You can go long, you can go short. Um, and it's just like a product that's a little bit more targeted at individual traders, but that is super useful for uh, more institutional traders as well. And that's what's really had liquidity build up around it in crypto. If I'm an outsider, right, I'm sitting at, I don't know, a big traditional asset manager. Here's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing everything's on crypto rails, right? There's no hook maybe into a bank account. You've got these complex derivatives, uh, maybe perpetual swaps or something created by this random company that ended up getting sued called BitMEX, right? Like I, I'm a little skeptical. So can you just give us maybe a look into like who's actually using this? Like, are these like deep, deep, deep crypto traders? Do you have traditional financial institutions using this? Like give us kind of a quantitative and qualitative look into your user base. Like how many are there? Who are they? Where does this thing go next? Yeah, absolutely. So we have kind of two main classes of target customers at DYDX. Um, the first class of customers is kind of what I was just touching on, the sophisticated individual traders um, that are based internationally. So there are a lot of these pretty sophisticated traders all over the world, um, especially a lot in Asia, a lot in Europe as well. Um, and these are kind of driving a good amount of volume on DYDX. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the crypto markets is that they've really served as a tool for um, people to become more financially literate. Um, actually, a lot of things in crypto, even though they may sound different at first glance to those who are familiar with traditional finance, are, at least in my opinion, more clear as to kind of what's going on. Like I was kind of talking about before, just perpetual futures are a lot more approachable product um, for individual traders than, say, like a dated option or a traditional kind of dated future. Um, the other class of customers that we have are more sophisticated crypto funds. Um, there are kind of two main types of these. The first and kind of most popular, on DYDX at least, um, is crypto native hedge funds. There are quite a lot of these that have sprung up um, in the past year. A number of them have gotten pretty large in terms of assets under management already and the trading volume that they're pushing through. Um, but these products like Perpetual Futures are super useful for those more advanced traders, both individual and these funds, because they give them access to just basically expressing more complex opinions on the price. Like you can go long, you can go short, um, you can bet on volatility, you can uh, trade with leverage, which just lets you trade with more capital, um, effective capital than you otherwise would be able to. Um, and then I guess the last point is there are um, some, not all, but like some of kind of the mainstream Wall Street funds that have started trading crypto. Um, and even especially in the past couple months, a good amount of these have started trading or, or working on spinning up trading 
on DYDX. I think DYDX has positioned itself as a really good stepping stone for a lot of these funds to get into DeFi because we're giving them access to these more professional tools, um, whereas most of the rest of DeFi is based on automated market makers, is based on the spot markets, whereas DYDX is both order book based and offers uh, more advanced products like perpetuals. Um, so a lot of them are pretty interested in trading on DYDX as kind of their first foray into DeFi as well. Um, I want to ask you a question, Anthony. One of the criticisms when the word derivatives and perpetuals comes up um, in, in traditional finance and certainly in, in crypto is sort of the the inefficiency, the pricing, or when there is sort of a huge market dislocation and, you know, there are days where there's a lot of liquidations and time and time again, centralized exchanges or even, you know, traditional financial institutions fail on the pricing or the execution in the moments where you need it the most. Um, and so I am curious if you could just give us a little bit of insight into how DYDX operates. Um, you know, in crypto, you, you, you see these markets that are, you know, either thinly traded or, uh, are not very robust and, and have a lot of volatility. And how does the system like DYDX absorb those shocks um, where uh, perhaps a centralized institution cannot? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say at a high level, we've taken a lot of learnings from what's worked well for centralized exchanges um, in terms of the construction of the products themselves, um, the usage of ins insurance funds, the usage of things like uh, liquidations, deleveraging, et cetera. Um, so at a very high level, I'd say DYDX operates from a financial perspective, at least pretty similarly to how an FTX operates. Um, effectively, everyone has collateral on the system, right? Um, there is some insurance fund, which gets added to um, in times of normal operation, potentially is dipped into in times of extreme market volatility. Um, on average, the Insurance fund on DYDX has been really consistently growing over time, which I think shows that the system has been pretty healthy, even in times where, like I think last month, there was a day when Bitcoin and ETH drops like 10 or 20 percent and altcoins dropped even more. And even in those times of extremely high market volatility, um, we and other exchanges in crypto, too, but especially on DYDX have shown that the market is pretty resilient. Um, I could go into a lot of things around this that probably are not super interesting. You know, there are uh, position based uh, limits based on like if you're taking a larger position, you can't use as much leverage. Just a lot of things that go into uh, making sure that the health of the system overall maintains intact. Um, a lot of engineering go effort goes into this. Um, in particular, DYDX, I think, has shown a really good history of uptime, especially during times of market volatility. This is something we're getting better at all the time, um, as basically like any startup does. But I think the space overall is maturing in a really big way. Um, and we're excited to be a part of that um, at DYDX. Antonio, I feel like when I got into crypto, um, the main decentralized exchange, ah, oh shoot, Ether, Ether Delta? I'm trying to remember. I think yeah. it, you remember mm -hmm. Ether Delta? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, like, that was a uh, that was an order book exchange, if I remember correctly. Like that was an order book based DEX. So that means you're trading against market makers. Then uh, the kind of popular thing that kicked off in DeFi summer was like these AMMs, right? It was all about Uniswap. And you could trade this long tail of liquidity and it was amazing. And now I feel like there's a push back towards these order book based DEXs. Like why, like when you think about like what the space looks like three to five years from now, like, are these AMMs? I'm, all the talk was about AMMs last year. Like, are AMMs going to be huge and order decentralized order book exchanges are, are going to be huge as well? Does one take the, the prize? Like, how do you see these kind of two things playing out against each other? Yeah, it's a great question. I think my answer would be that both will be really significant in the long term. I can talk about why we at UIDX, specifically for what we're trying to do, chose order books. Um, this is not a super original thought, but my opinion is that automated market makers are really excellent for serving like the long tail of markets. Um, you know, you can go on Uniswap and trade thousands of assets, whereas DYDX only has support right now for, I think, like 30 or 40 assets or markets on the exchange. So clearly automated market makers are better if you want to trade the long tail of assets. The reason we're focused on order books at DYDX is because of our very high level goal that you talked about in the beginning, which is to become one of the biggest exchanges in crypto in the world, not just decentralized, but like taking on centralized exchanges as well. And if you look at the breakdown of volume um, by market and by product in crypto, 
First of all, like we've been talking about, perpetual futures already are, I think, more than two thirds of the entire trading volume for all crypto products, including spot markets. So if you want to be one of the biggest decentralized exchanges, first of all, by definition, you got to focus on derivatives. And that's why we do a DYDX. Second of all, most of the volume is still pretty concentrated and call it like the top like 50 to 100 markets and especially very concentrated in Bitcoin and ETH. Um, the, you know, there are new markets like Solana has done a ton of volume in the past year, Avalanche, et cetera. And there's some kind of of the more like five to 30 top markets. But the point here is that if you want to capture most of the volume on crypto, you should serve those top markets and you should serve them really well. And for us and kind of most traders, uh, serving a market really well effectively means having deep liquidity in those markets. The reason we're focused on order books, at least the primary reason, is because we feel like we can build um, or the exchange can build more liquidity on the top uh, tier of markets with an order book model um, based on kind of an AMM model. You can effectively just translate uh, the same amount of capital into much deeper liquidity um, using professional market makers on an order book than you can on an AMM. Um, and that's kind of the reason we're focused on order books. Kind of going back to your question about like why did crypto or you know more specifically DeFi start with order books? Then we saw this like surge of AMMs and kind of as you say, right now we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence of order books. I'd say it's technological. Um, you know the main limitation that you always have to think about when you're building in DeFi is scalability. So kind of the first thing that was tried on DeFi was building an order book on chain on Ethereum. And this was just horribly inefficient because every time a market maker wanted to place an order, cancel an order, do anything at all, you had to place a transaction on layer one Ethereum, which was quite expensive and really limited the throughput. Um, so this limited a lot the amount of liquidity that could be built on order book based models because of the underlying scalability of the blockchain. Kind of the core innovation we've had at DYDX since then, and it's taken a while to build, uh, TLDR is just pretty complicated, is we build an order book off-chain and we run an off-chain matching model right now. This allows us to serve tons of orders. I think right now on DYDX, we have about 300 to 400 orders placed per second, um, and we can scale to even much more than that. But this allows us to build deep liquidity to allow our market makers to quote with no transaction fees. Um, and uh, you know, effectively, we can build more liquidity because of that. Whereas automated market makers, um, the real innovation that they had is they make being a market maker very simple, right? Because all you have to do is deposit to the pool. Whereas if you want to run a market maker on an order book based exchange, you need to be pretty sophisticated. You need to build like a trading bot. You need to be placing and canceling orders all the time, quoting. Um, but this also translates to scalability as well, because if you're makers, if you're like Uniswap and your makers, all they have to do is place one deposit transaction, it's very different than having to place and cancel, you know, tens to hundreds of orders per second. So I'd say that the scalability has been a pretty big impactor of that. Um, and, you know, another thing I think we're excited about at DYDX is just pushing forward the technology of decentralized exchanges. Um, and that's been like a pretty big impactor of like why um, I think order books are coming back now. The other kind of adjacent point to this that I'll touch on for what we've built in UIDX, especially recently, the main thing that we launched um, for our product in the past year has been a migration to layer two. Um, this was launched about like nine or so months ago now. Um, we built on top of uh, this technology that's called zero knowledge rollups in partnership with a company called Starkware. And this effectively allows us to process much, much more transactions, uh, much more cheaply than you can do on an Ethereum layer one. And this kind of ties in with the increase in scalability that I was just touching on as to like why order books, um, I think are seeing a resurgence now. And that, I think that'll continue to be the case as like more types of things that you can build are unlocked as the technology of blockchains and DeFi moves forwards. Empire is proud to be supported by Avalanche. There is a layer one war heating up in crypto and Avalanche is at the center of it. Avalanche is one of the fastest smart contract platforms in the industry. I've been looking into the ecosystem recently and I'm honestly amazed by how fast it's growing. Here are three reasons why I'm so intrigued by Avalanche. Number one, Curve and Aave, two of the biggest DeFi protocols are in testing right now for Avalanche integrations. Number two, new projects. 
These are not just NFT clones, AMM knockoffs, and lending protocols. These are new projects, NFT projects, play to earn games, really, really interesting stuff happening in the Avalanche ecosystem. And number three, Binance just re-enabled C-Chain integration. What in the world does this mean? This means that you, the user, can directly withdraw to your MetaMask, which previously was a pretty big user bottleneck. Thank you, Avalanche, for sponsoring Empire. We are going to continue to explore Avalanche in future episodes. Hope you enjoy it. I would recommend that you do the same. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH, Polygon, as you can see here, BSC, they recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. If you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I wanna swap you know, 0.2 ETH, for USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. You were one of the projects that pivoted early to an L2, in this case, Starkware, which my layman understanding is it's it's very well catered for the type of application that you wanted to use. Like Diversify also uses it. Obviously, like there are other applications of Starkware like Mutable, this sort of volition and validium, I think, that allows the flexibility of a trader. Um, you know, I'm curious, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about scalability in Ethereum and, and, and you know, for something like DYDX, like, what are some of the things, if you could just go deeper into, what is it that is so powerful about this L2? Um, and, and what are the applications, the use cases that, that are unlocked uh, as a result of that? And, and kind of what is the is there an upper bound to all of this at some point where you're just going to hit um, and, and never truly be able to compete on a performance basis, if you will, maybe on security or some other aspects against like a FTX, if you will? Yeah, good question. So in terms of like, why did we choose Starkware and, you know, specifically the technology of zero knowledge rollups to build on? Um, there were two main reasons. First of all, it is an Ethereum based rollup, which means um, we settle back on the Ethereum chain eventually, which means we kind of get a lot of the awesome decentralization and security guarantees of Ethereum. And it's also really easy to onboard and offboard to DYDX's layer two, because you can just send a regular old Ethereum transaction to get on DYDX and just deposit funds like you would to a normal decentralized exchange. Um, zero knowledge rollups, one of the re main reasons we're, we're really excited about them is that they offer a really high level of scalability at a very high level. The way that they work, um, is you take some amount of data or some amount of transactions. And for us at DYDX, that means say like all the trades that you might want to execute on DYDX for say an entire hour, then you take that list of all the trades for the entire hour you run what's called a zero knowledge or kind of stark based proof on them. And this is kind of Starkware's secret sauce, the thing that they um, you know, built and have been innovating on. You run the zero knowledge proof on that list of trades. And what you get out of that is this constant sized uh, proof data object. And then you can just submit this really small constant sized uh, proof to the blockchain. It can verify um, that all of these you know, list of you know, thousands of trades actually happened, we're valid, we're collateralized, we're assigned by the appropriate parties, etc. Um, but the cool thing about it is that it doesn't matter how many trades you have in this list. It could be one trade, could be a thousand, could be 10,000, could be more. The proof that you get out of that is still always the same size. And that's where all of the scalability comes from. 
Um, and that's why we're excited about it. Um, I think right now it's costs like a hundred, somewhere between a hundred and a thousand times less gas to execute a trade on uh, DYDX slash Darkwares uh, layer two than it does to execute that same trade on Ethereum layer one. So that's kind of the main reason we're excited about it. They offer a really high level of scalability. They still get you the security, um, the non-custodial nature in the same level that Ethereum itself does. It doesn't require, require any sort of game theoretical uh, finality uh, guarantees. Just cryptographically, like once this proof is submitted to the blockchain, it's 100% valid and there's, there's no way to fake it. The main things that we're thinking about for scalability going forward is kind of in partnership with Starkware is how do we scale the proving layer of like um, these proofs. The main blocker is actually not so much submitting the data to Ethereum. It's more that generating these proofs is still relatively expensive. And that's start something that Starkware is continuing to iterate on. I think there will be really big order of magnitude type changes coming out for that in the future. Um, but that's the main thing that we're working on kind of in partnership with them. I'm not an expert personally on zero knowledge proofs. You know, I just know a good bit about them, like anecdotally through working with Starkware. Um, but, you know, I do think they have some ex exciting things that they're working on to be able to scale this technology to even a lot more um, than what we're currently doing. But even what we're currently doing, I think is pretty impressive. Um, we've been doing somewhere between 300 to 500,000 trades per day on DYDX and could fairly easily scale up to more um and that's more than you know enough to serve the needs of our customers for now yeah absolutely um and i think i'm glad you mentioned that um i think it, there's been certainly a lot of heated discussion recently amongst um folks that say hey look ethereum's just taking too long to scale and figure out a, a, a credible viable practical roadmap to scalability and certainly there's these l2s and there's there's ro optimistic rollups and then there's you know zero knowledge proofs and zk rollups and all this stuff but there is another subset in this world, like Solana's of the world, that um, you know offer a different alternative. Um, and I think I might have seen a tweet of yours that says, "Hey, candidly, like it has been frustrating as a founder built on top of Ethereum to be innovating at the app layer, but you know it's still quite expensive to interact on chain." And so I'm curious if you could elaborate on that. And from your perspective. Is there a version of this world where you, you just abandon Ethereum or, or deploy in another chain like Solana? Um, and what, what, what is a, it, one, have you thought about that? Two, would you, there's a lot of, I would abandon this to go, or is it just a parallel instantiation where you would go to Solana and also support Ethereum and also support, you know, at Polkadot and some other chain and, and just have multiple deployments of DYDX. Um, so if you could walk us through that, I think it would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So two great questions there. I guess tackling the first one in terms of like more expanding more on my thoughts on Ethereum versus other chains. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like I and I think some other developers like have been somewhat frustrated with the uh, progress or sort of like lack thereof of development specifically on layer one on Ethereum. Layer twos aside, you know, I talked about that. Obviously, I'm really excited about it. Um, but I think the point here, the point I was kind of making in my tweets that I sent out like a month ago, is that layer twos are not specific to any layer one. Like you could build pretty much any given um, layer two on top of any given layer one. Certainly there's some like implementation details and it's not quite that simple, but you know, all the progress that's been made on layer twos, I wouldn't attribute to like Ethereum specifically. Um, obviously ETH2 is being worked on um, I, I'm not an expert on ETH2, so like I'm not going to dive like too deeply into it. But my very rough, high-level impression is that there likely won't be any improvements um, for DApps, at least with ETH2. Probably in like three years, at least. I don't. That's my estimate. It's really hard to tell, but that's uh, my impression. Um, so given that, like. And, and given the fact that DYDX is a real product right now that is literally trading billions of dollars in trade volume per day, it's really, really important for us to offer the best possible product that we can right now. You know, improvements three years from now, that's great. Like I'm looking forward to that, but that doesn't really help like the product or like the bottom line right now. So given that, like, I think there are a lot of other projects that are executing at like a pretty high level. Like you talked about a few of them, like Solana, I'm excited about Cosmos, potentially about like things like Polkadot and Substrate. 
Um, and I think these teams are executing at a high level and they are building interesting, legitimate technologies. Um, obviously, there are trade offs with them. Like, I would definitely say that they, um, you know, those layer ones are not yet as decentralized as Ethereum is. Um, in like some aspects of what you mean, might mean by the word decentralization, but they obviously are way more performant. Um, they potentially have better you know, development experiences to build on top of. You could potentially build things on top of them that just aren't possible to build on top of Ethereum. So to answer your question directly, yes, absolutely. We're like looking into those. We're really seriously considering like moving to potentially other layer one chains. Um, and we would absolutely do that if we felt that we could build a better product on top of them. And I would also maybe tackle the question of, for us, what does building a better product mean? It means a lot of things and there are trade-offs to them, similar to how there are trade-offs with different layer ones. It means offering our users lower transaction fees. It means um, you know, being able to support more trades per second, potentially having better finality, um, potentially being able to build things that just aren't possible to build because we're on Ethereum right now. It also means uh, what is the level of decentralization we can offer? What's the level of security? What's the level of censorship resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all things that we take into account and Ethereum does better on some of them and worse on other ones. Um, the main reason why I'm like excited about potentially things beyond Ethereum um, is that they, and I said it before, but they just seem to be executing faster. Like, I think this is just the way technologies work. If you don't, build things, you other people will, and they will, you know, you'll get outcompeted by those people. You know, all that being said, obviously, I'm a huge supporter of Ethereum. DYDX right now is, you know, rolled up back to Ethereum, like I was just talking about a couple minutes ago, we think that offers our users a very high level of security and decentralization. Um, but I don't think Ethereum has a monopoly on decentralization and security going forward. So mm -hmm. it's tough to rely entirely on that as a layer one. Yeah. Now, kind of answering your second question, like, okay, you know, suppose DYDX were to believe that uh, some other chain has like a better set of trade-offs to build on top of than Ethereum does, like, what would we do in that case? And and also this, let's just be clear, this is a very much a hypothetical still, like, we're still excited about Ethereum. But if we were to believe that, um, like, do we build in a multi-chain environment? Like, do we, as you say, deploy DYDX onto a bunch of different chains at the same time? Or do we stay really focused on just one particular chain? Um, I kind of have, I think, a counterculture view on this relative to what I see most protocols doing. Um, there's been a pretty big wave of a lot of these protocols deploying on a lot of different chains. Like, I think there was just a proposal that was passed on Uniswap to deploy on Polygon. And they're like also on optimism. And I think Arbitrum too, obviously Aave is like deployed a lot of different places um, and a number of different protocols are. Um, I don't think that's the right approach, at least for DYDX. Um, and the reason I think that is because the most important concept in finance is the concept of liquidity. Um, and I talked a lot about that in my previous answer. But if you're just deploying on multiple chains, you're really splitting up liquidity in a pretty harmful way. Um, and you're also just splitting up your user base, right? Like, I think it's interesting on Uniswap. Um, I think they've done a good job of it from a product perspective, but it's like you have, you go to uniswap.org and you, there's like a drop down where you can like use Uniswap on like optimism or, or polygon or whatever is kind of my understanding. Um, so it's just kind of dividing your user base, right? Like, you know, maybe a third of your users will want to use optimism. Maybe like a third of them will want to use polygon. But at least for me, and again, like this is the most core thing to DYDX, all I care about is building the best possible product for our users. Like if you believe that one of those three is the best possible product, just build on that and like make it like the best possible product for your users and like devote all of your efforts into building the best possible product on that chain in particular. You know, obviously it's important to still offer a really good onboarding experience from wherever users may have their funds um, you know, like suppose again, just like super hypothetically, but like suppose DYDX were like deploying onto Solana or something like that. Like we'd probably want to make sure that users from Ethereum or users from Polygon could have like a really good onboarding experience, like onto Solana, DYDX, et cetera. But all this to say, like if we were to build on some new chain, we would only build on that chain, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and we would, you know, effectively deprecate like the system that we the currently system. have, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I realize is maybe like kind of a strong opinion. Like I know, I, I don't know, personally, I think it's kind of weird, but like, I know people in crypto are sort of like have cult like followings around their like chain of choice and like, that's fine. That's great. Um, like I, I respect like a lot of the growth that that's driven for mm -hmm. like each of these different communities. And we do listen to these communities, but again, like, I don't, I don't know why this is like sort of a weird opinion, like in crypto, but like, all I care about is building the best possible product. And if I think that we'll build the best possible product on a given chain, we're just going to do that. And like, everyone should just like, you know, they, they shouldn't, they, they shouldn't just believe that it's the best possible product. They should try the product and hopefully it will be the best possible product like for them. But I think it's more about that and kind of less about just deploying on a bunch of these chains to, I don't know, like satisfy the communities of those chains um, and stuff like that. It's such a good point and, 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 and candidly a refreshing take because my view is that we're so, so early that I, I, I do agree with you. I think good products always win. And, and I think you're almost building the question is, do you build for the existing subset of users today, which is a microcosm of the financial system, or do you build for the billion users that can come and assume that they will, and you just make these trade-offs? And, you know, I think like, um, you know, maybe a question for you is, I mean, I think a lot of the experience in a lot of the arguments of Ethereum is, look, this is where a lot of the, eco the ecosystem here is just bigger. And you talk about the benefits of composability and it's so fun and, you know, you can interact with all these different financial primitives and systems and money Legos and, and, and great. It's being built in other systems as well and, and catching up fairly quickly. Um, but I am curious how you think about like user loyalty here. Are users loyal to Ethereum or are users loyal and there's brand affiliation to DYDX? And if you were to totally you know, migrate over to something like Solana, do your users even care at that point about Ethereum or they care about, Hey, look, I just like the YDX because I trade here. This is where I do margin trading and that's it. I actually don't care where I go. Or would you think that a subset of your user base might say, Hey, wait a minute, I'm using all these other systems in, in Ethereum. I'm actually going to go find something similar to the YDX here. Um, or, or, you know, Maybe put, I mean, I know it's hard to peg numbers, but if you say, hey, look, 90% of my users would be comfortable making the trade and go to Solana right now because they like DYDX and that's it. Or is it 10%? And they'll, and they'll just abandon. Yeah. I'm just sort of curious to get how you, how you think about it. Great question. I don't really know what the exact percent of users that say we went to a different chain. Again, hypothetically, it would like follow us to like some different chain. I would argue it's probably more in the like 75% range um, than like the minority. Like I think that we built a really good product and users use DYDX because they like DYDX. It's not because they like are super hyped on Ethereum and like, you know, they want to use it because of that. Maybe, maybe some of our users are, um, but probably they're in the minority, but maybe zooming out a little bit and just kind of tying it back to what we started the episode with, like, what is our goal at DYDX? It's not to become the biggest decentralized exchange. And that's really important. And it's like, we've already, you know, arguably gotten pretty close at least to hitting that goal. Like, I think we're trading back and forth for the one spot with Uniswap. Um, but our goal is to become one of the biggest exchanges in crypto, not just decentralized exchanges. So by definition, like the people that we need to get on DYDX are not on DeFi yet, like they are on CeFi. And like our biggest mission for DYDX over the next couple of years is like getting those users that are like trading on FTX, that are trading on Binance, you know, maybe that aren't even trading crypto at all, but that are knowledgeable about derivatives to use DYDX. And again, this comes back to like, let's just build the best possible product here. And like, again, yeah, let's make sure the onboarding is really good. But like the bulk of the users that we will get sort of in this like hypothetical world where DYDX becomes one of the biggest exchanges are not going to be like diehard ETH fans. They're not going to be diehard like Solana fans. They're not going to be diehard like Polygon fans. There'll be some of those in like any case, but that's not, you know, I respect all of those communities and like what they've built, but that's not like for us, for our business, like what we're going after. Um, and I think we have pretty intentionally like not necessarily aligned ourselves with like any one of these like particular communities for better or worse. You know, a lot of different projects have like honestly done a better job of, of us than like of like building community and especially like tying in with like other, especially DeFi and like blockchain communities. Um, but for us, we're just like so product focused and you said it, but like the, the pr best products usually went 
Um, and we're building for like the next like, you know, million UIDX users, not like the, the current users that we have. Um, and I think that's like a really intentional choice. And I think something that will pay off for us in the long run, but that may or may not like alienate like specific users of like diehard communities in the meantime. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I want to transition. This discussion is fascinating. I want to transition a little bit into how powerful the token has been for you guys. Uh, we talk about, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, this space has gone from tokens to then tokens are taboo to now tokens are, you know, the real juice here, which allows anyone to have ownership and to participate in, in the upside of, of these, as these systems get more demand and scale, you know, early adopters and contributors can accrue value. Um, I think if I look at your volume and, and how much of that has grown as a result of you guys issuing a token, I am curious how you think about the sustainability across DeFi, but also tying it back to DYDX in terms of, you know, one, how important this is for your growth. And two, you know, where would DYDX be without a token? Because, you know, and, and, and do you think that every single DeFi protocol needs to have a token? Because that is just the nature of the game now. If you're, if you don't have a token, you're at a disadvantage. And so, I, and then if so, then does it become sort of this game where like you always be, try to be one upped by the next protocol issuing another whole set of rewards that might be really nearsighted and short term and focused, but not very sustainable. And it becomes a very, I don't know, maybe not very sustainable strategy from customer acquisition and retention standpoint. Um, and I know there's a lot there, but I'm just generally curious how you think about tokens, the kind of impact that it had to your business and, and, and that you think will the, the sort of the key learnings that you've observed in the short period of time since you've deployed the token. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that I'd say is that I don't think the business model of like having tokens is even like crypto specific. Yeah. Maybe that's not said the best way, but like giving incentivization or like giving rewards or like, you know, bootstrapping your growth um, as a tech company more broadly through like throwing rewards or like something that has value at it is, is not new. I think that tokens just supercharged it in a really big way. Um, and that's why they're super interesting. Um, you know, like if you're Uber and you're like, you know, subsidizing a couple dollars on every ride that happens it's required to like, you know, bootstrap the liquidity on the company to bootstrap the growth to like go up against the incumbents. Um, and that's something that we've just seen this play out time and time again in, in tech in general, that is a sustainable growth strategy. Like once you get to be to, like the best product to have the liquidity to have most of the users, then you don't need to throw quite as many call it rewards at them. Again, I think tokens are really interesting and they do supercharge this growth by just kind of like bypassing a lot of the inefficiencies for, for normal companies and normal funding, et cetera, in a lot of meaningful ways. And the most exciting thing about it is tokens literally give um, the community and the users of a protocol um, ownership and decision-making power over the protocol itself. And this is already playing out in a really exciting way on DYDX. Um, a lot of our whale traders, community users, um, and trading funds that are using DYDX play a really active role in governance. Um, and I think that makes them just feel very long-term aligned with the success of the protocol because they have a you know, financial incentive to see the protocol succeed overall and they're less so like mercenaries. So I think in terms of like takeaways that we've had from uh, you know, the foundation launching the token, the main one is that yes, the token can be an amazing growth driver. I mean, just look at the numbers for DYDX um, in the past couple of months. Obviously, it's uh, been hugely impactful. The main thing that I think that you need to think about when you're designing a token and like the main learning that we had and the thing I think the foundation did a really good job of was designing incentives such that um, the things that you're incentivizing are real and that are like main like usage patterns of your product. Um, there are a lot of different rewards programs, token rewards programs on DYDX right now. Specifically, there's one around trading um, where users are rewarded based on the multiplier of their fees paid and open interest on the platform. And that just really effectively rewards uh, real like actual trading patterns on DYDX. There's liquidity uh, rewards. There's uh, token rewards that go to market makers and liquidity providers on the exchange. And that's liter literally driven um, 
us to become one of the most liquid crypto exchanges in the world, not just in DeFi, but like we're as liquid as Binance right now. Like just kind of go look at our spread and our depth right now. Like the liquidity is the same. Um, and that I think is something that I wouldn't have really thought was possible, to be honest, like before the token was launched. Um, so I think I've just been really excited about the level of growth that they drove. You know, we always, I, I always thought that like tokens would, would be like a really great growth driver for protocols. Obviously that was empirically proven by things like compound, Uniswap, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I was never against like specifically like the DYDX protocol launching a token. Um, but rather I felt like, and the reason it took us uh, or took the protocol a while to launch a token was that um, we felt like we really wanted to build an excellent product before we launched the token. Um, and therefore um, we felt like, you know, it took us a while to build that product. Um, and once that product existed and then the token was launched, then you were able to throw fuel on the fire of this already really awesome product. You're able to scale it from there in a really huge way. And that's kind of what happened on DYDX in the past year. Yeah, definitely. So transitioning in, in, and as a segue to that, I guess like, you know, DeFi, I think went through the, and, and just crypto markets in general go through these phases of like, you know, narratives and, and become really, really powerful, right? In, in DeFi, I remember when, when I started Parify, you know, it wasn't even a thing. And we just said, like, this is going to be a big thing. And, and then Compound launched. But you had early indications of that, like synthetics have been around for a while. Maker, you know, you kind of really needed that stablecoin layer to then build on top of that all these money logos. And it was encouraging if you were paying attention. Now, of course, you know, DeFi has gone to DeFi summer and then sort of like a peak of disillusionment, if you will. Um, you know, there's still some really exciting innovation. Like I look at something, what you guys are doing, and it's, it's super powerful. I mean, I think like thematically, like perps, futures, and options are like the next frontier of DeFi. I think it's going to be explosive. Uh, just looking at what is happening in centralized exchanges um, and, and uniquely enabled kind of like L2s, right? And, and or, or perhaps other higher performance blockchains like Solana. Um, but, you know, DeFi is a bit out of favor at the moment. Like everyone's paying attention to NFTs and gaming. Um, and so I am curious, like, what is your thesis for decentralized finance? Like if you talk to someone on you know, traditional Wall Street and say, you know, is, is this just a you know, small group of really passionate finance geeks and nerds that are just going to trade against, you know, it's, it's a very small user base at the moment. So I'm curious what your thesis is, is you talk about building the largest exchange, full stop. Um, but how, how big do you see DeFi growing? Like, what, is, what does DeFi look like in the next five years or in the next, like, 10 years? Um, and, and I guess, so let's start there. Obviously, I want to talk about what could imp- you know, what could get in the way of, of that realization, regulation, a bunch of other stuff, but just starting, how big do you think this market can get in over the next couple of years? Yeah. I mean, I think it can be an absolutely huge market. Um, all markets start out with early adopters, right? And that's really what's going on in crypto more broadly right now. And especially in DeFi, clearly a lot of these market participants are already pushing quite a lot of trade volume through these platforms. Like we're doing about $2 billion a day. And I think so is Uniswap more or less. Um, so there is some real activity going on today, but we do see a ton of growth in these markets over time for a lot of the reasons I talked about um, in the beginning of, of the episode. Um, and I think that these markets uh, will spread, these markets in DeFi will kind of spread to be uh, the biggest trading markets in crypto, at least for crypto to crypto trading, which has already shown to be the biggest market in crypto. I think crypto to crypto um, already is way bigger than like fiat to crypto trading. Um, so I think that hypothesis will continue to be the case far into the future. And to me, it just kind of makes sense to trade these decentralized assets that are just open source permissionless code on a decentralized exchange where both the code, the exchange and the assets themselves are fully decentralized, are open source code. Um, and, you know, that have the properties of transparency and security that most traders care a lot about. So I think they'll become bigger in the future. The other thing that I'm excited about in crypto is kind of more, call it real world assets being traded within crypto. Um, right now in the crypto markets, a lot of people have tried this, right? Like trading different versions of, you know, tokenized gold or tokenized equities, et cetera, et cetera. And it hasn't caught on in a big way yet. But I think there will be kind of an inflection point or a tipping point at some point in the future, probably like three to five years from now, 
um, when a lot of these more real world assets just get traded on crypto rails because the crypto markets, crypto exchanges, DeFi are improving so fast over time that I think they'll eventually become uh, just better, more liquid, you know, a lot more transferable, a lot more instant um, than traditional uh, rails to trade a lot of these products. And that's especially why I'm excited about derivatives as well. Um, you know, really the only thing that you need to trade derivatives is like an exchange and collateral. Um, and crypto clearly has both of those. Um, so I'm especially excited about like derivatives on more real world assets over time. Um, obviously, FTX is doing some exciting stuff there. We're paying a lot of attention to that. Um, no firm plans to launch anything like that um, at any point in the near future. Um, but I think once crypto continues to improve over the next three to five years from a technological perspective um, and also from sort of a legitimacy perspective, let's say, as like it continues to stick around, it continues to grow, more people continue to come in over time. We get past like the early adopter phase in terms of crypto trading. Um, that the late adopters and kind of like the, the bulk of the adoption curve um, will drive a huge amount of volume to crypto. And I think specifically to DeFi, because like I was saying, I think DeFi can just build a better trading product um, than CeFi can. Um, so I, I do see a lot of growth opportunities here. There are certainly a lot of risks, both like technological and other to be able to get there. Um, but that's kind of what we're excited to take on and build for it. Yeah, I'd be... Um remiss not to bring this point up, which is, you know, when you talk about regulars talk about the risk of DeFi and I think what they in, in a lot of financial institutions that I've talked to are like, well, look, I understand the technology of it. The premise of a smart contract, perfectly transparent system, executing logic in a very binary, non-arbitrary way is very powerful. The problem is, as you continue to iterate, they're, they're, they're code breaking in, in this decentralized world that we call Web3, specifically DeFi, has a lot of implications that are not easy. You can't reverse, right? I mean, I think if, if there's a, and it specifically hacks, right? When, when this stuff happens, it's not fun. You, you can't build fast and break things here. If you break things, users' funds are lost and that's it. And so I, I still think that that is perhaps one of the biggest, um, you know, obstacles that funds need to get their, you know, over and, um, and maybe just wait out more Lindy effect in the system. But, you know, it is very early. You guys are innovating. All these other systems are innovating quite quickly. So they're, they're not, you know, uh, that has implications, right? They're, that increases the surface area and the complexity and could, you know, the risk is still quite, quite high. And I think in some respects you're being compensated for that, right? And yields and, and you see that on chain. Um, but it's more of a question of like, you know, when you go on FTX, when you go on Coinbase, centralized exchange, yeah, you're certainly taking a risk of a counterparty risk, a huge one maybe, or a big one. Um, but it's still native. It still feels more comfortable than going into this open permissionless. There's no 1-800 customer support service that you can resort to if, if, if things break. And I'm curious, in this transit, like, where do you ever think that we'll get to a point where there's sufficient Lindy effect and standards in place. And maybe it's a permission market. I don't know. You know, there's certainly pr protocols like Aave that have experimented with, hey, let's launch a permission market. And maybe that has, you know, more guardrails that can, you know, if things go wrong, at least it's mitigated and you can, you know, um, at least institutions can get more comfortable operating in this wild west that they see. Um, and there's a hack happening every other day. And so I'm curious, um, how you think about that and, and what is the response and what would you say to a traditional financial institution? Yeah. So first of all, I absolutely agree with you. I do think security is extremely important, obviously, and it's not just for DYDX. I think this is one of the most important things that DeFi at large needs to do a really good job of to gain legitimacy over time is to just continue to have like the biggest, you know, blue chip protocols in the space um, execute at a high level and not suffer security incidents and not suffer like big fund losses and things. I think there also will likely be a consolidation over time in DeFi towards just more, call it legitimate or more secure protocols that have like a longer history of uh, executing security best practices at a high level. 
Um, one of the things that I'm personally excited about is I, I do think like some level of in the general term, sense, like regulation is useful for DeFi, but specifically regulation that makes sense. And it's exactly what you're talking about, right? Like users should know like how secure the protocols they're using are, whether they've been audited, um, whether the teams are following the security best practices, like what is the history um, of this particular piece of software, like running in production without issues, et cetera. Um, that's something we're just kind of in, you know, early talks with other like top DeFi companies about potentially forming like some sort of like quasi like self-regulatory organization to make sure those best practices are being followed, make sure there's transparency um, about like what admin controls, if any exist, what security best practices are being followed, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think there should be more, call it infrastructure put up in place for DeFi as a whole to gain leg legitimacy and make sure that users, whether they're institutional or not, make, have the best information and the most secure platforms to trade on. So I think it's really important. Um, in terms of uh, like what DYDX has done and like is doing going forwards on security, we uh, obviously audit all of our smart contract code. We uh, make sure we have 100% test coverage. We hire like the highest quality engineers and we do put a really big emphasis on not moving too fast and making sure um, all the code that we're putting out is secure um, and well tested at least um, before it hits production. Um, it's kind of balance, right? Like as a startup and as an industry, like you need to move quickly um, if you want to continue to be competitive in the space. But as I was saying, I think users should be really cognizant of the risk that they're taking on and should have the tools to inform themselves as to like what the risk is over time. Um, the other thing I'll say is a lot of DeFi as a whole is still super new, right? Um, you know, not DYDX is kind of a DeFi OG at this point, and we've only been around for like four years. Um, so I think as the space matures and as a lot of these security best practices get improved, call it like even like five to 10 years from now, if not sooner, um, then people will start to see a lot of these uh, really battle tested uh, third uh DeFi projects as being more secure than centralized exchanges. And I think that's already kind of happening in a big way, you know, with a lot of these projects like uh, Aave or Compound that have had a history of billions of dollars sitting in these pools, huge incentives to hack them and still no issues being found for years. Um, I think we're starting to build up this reputation as an industry in DeFi um, that it is pretty secure, um, quite secure, at least with the call it like top, like blue chip uh, DeFi protocols. And I think people will start to feel more that way over time, but it just takes time, right? It's almost kind of a feeling thing, right? Like even outside of quantifiably, how secure is it? Like it's more about like, do fee people feel secure? Is it like similar to like what they've experienced in the past? And I think that more people will start to feel secure with DeFi over time. Um, as like I was saying, it continues to execute at a high level, like be very, uh, have, have a good history of not suffering incidents, et cetera. Um, and that'll lead to more people adopting it over time. And for those who don't adopt it, like they'll just get out competed by the people that do. Maybe as a last point, uh, as we wrap up the discussion, um, you know, DAOs are all the rage these days. Um, and of course, you guys set up a foundation and, you know, you know operate in some capacity as a DAO um, for these token holders that um, what is the role of, of the DAO in your system? And and what does that look like? Um, you know, because you talk about building great products, right? And I, my understanding is there will always be a centralized entity research lab, if you will, that is pushing that forward. And and then the DAO may elect to, you know, adopt that or, or what have you. But what is the relationship between the team, the DYDX teams that existed for such a long time and this kind of DAO organization that is governing certain parameters or, or parts of the system? So I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit on that for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you said it well, like there's always sort of this research like labs type team that is building the core software, let's call it. Um, independently from that, there is the DYDX Foundation um, that was created and has its mission as proliferating governance and international growth on the protocol. 
Um, so that's kind of running totally independently. And then the new thing that's coming out, um, sort of similar to a lot of what you've seen in DeFi at large, um, and this is a super new thing, like a governance vote was just passed um, for to, to enable this on DYDX, is the DAO. Um, and what does a DAO mean? It's sort of just a collection of community members, um, sort of committee members that are able to make decisions, allocate capital um, by independent third-party teams um, to build the ecosystem around DYDX. Um, and I think all of these have their own role to play and they're all super important. Um, but we'll continue to push more over time, um, especially driven by the foundation um, towards this DAO ecosystem where I think more and more things will be owned and driven by the DAO over time. But at least for the foreseeable future, there will sort of be this like labs type research um, and engineering driven organization um, that is uh, developing the code at least for DYDX in a more central way. Got it. And then the DAO can, I mean, so in terms of like risk parameters in the system, that is not up for the DAO or, or is that governable? That, that is up capacity? to the DAO actually. Got like it. they have control over like the risk parameters for the system, collateralization, what code gets upgraded, uh, et cetera. And uh, yeah, but I, I mean, th those are some of the things that require a, a fairly high degree of ex expertise to to govern. Do you worry at any point that these your DAO or other DAOs that are, you know, expecting community members to step up and like who who is actually credibly competent, equipped to govern that? I would think that it's a very small subset of users, whether it's specialized organizations like, you know, Tarun's shop or, or which is, I forget the name, it escapes me, but, um, you know, th these are not, you know, your t traditional voting schemes. It is just, it requires a lot of expertise and at different points in, in the market, in the cycle, we've seen a lot of enthusiasm right now in crypto, but you know, at varying times there isn't, you know, as specifically in some like a bear market, you know, you might not have a lot of interest. I remember certain discords like synthetics, basically it was like 10 people, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it can be hard to not only that, but it can open up in a vector of attack for these systems. If you borrow a lot of these governance shares and then, can implement a proposal that might be problematic. I think Compound had this problem where, you know, this a certain piece of code was deployed on the rewards kind of Merkle tree distribution and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, and it sort of just passed. And I think it was a third party that submitted the code and got approved. And there's obviously an issue with that. Um, and so this is sort of the drawbacks of, of kind of decentralization, which is when, when, when there's a DAO and, you know, there's not a small unit that is controlling these decisions. It can, it can obviously have negative side effects. So I'm curious um, how you think about the evolution of your DAO and, and kind of progressively decentralizing, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there is still a really big need in DAOs for leaders to emerge, you know, whether that's, you know, me, whether that's like prominent members of the community, like, you know, Three Arrows, like Wintermute, like some of our investors to step up and champion the changes that they think like will be best for the protocol to implement over time. But then there's sort of this like check and balance of like, it still has to pass this token weighted voting system. Um, and, you know, I, I don't just get to say like whatever I want and like that definitely happens or, or anybody else for that matter. Um, so I do think there's like a really big need for uh, leaders to have a strong voice in DAOs. And we're excited for more and more of those over time. Um, to be organic members of the community. Um, but it's important for them to be really core contributors to the discussion, to post prominently, you know, like I post like tweets, um, other people uh, post uh, their thoughts publicly about like what they think should be implemented in the system. So, you know, I don't think it's reasonable, as you say, to like expect every single member of the DYDX community to have like a deep understanding of financial concepts, uh, collateralization, like risk ratios, et cetera. Um, but I think that people can build up credibility over time to be strong voices um, and to also have the other cool thing about uh, governance is that you can delegate votes as well. So mm -hmm. like for those who do have um, really strong voices and they're saying really reasonable, like rational things and kind of build up more of a following around them over time. You can get votes delegated to them. Like, you know, people will probably listen to them and uh, likely will will vote based on what prominent community members are, are championing, et cetera. 
So I don't, I think it's somewhere in between like a, a system where like everybody uh, is deciding hundred percent for themselves and like has no guidance or anything and a system that's totally centralized where one party is just saying, this is what we're doing and that's hundred percent. And I think it's something that'll evolve over time. And that's exciting. Um, just kind of this combination of like prominent leaders that are making really rational arguments for the changes and the direction that they think is best for the protocol um, combined with these checks and balances of you still got to pass the token votes over time. So yeah, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, right? A lot of this decentralized governance stuff really just took off in the past year. And how we think about it at DYDX is just trying to take all of the best practices that we saw um, in the space at large and um, put them into the DYDX governance process itself. Um, but I think it's something that will continue to evolve over time. Yeah. You know, you've been around the space for quite a bit of time. You've been in Coinbase. You've obviously now built DYDX, which is highly successful. And, you know, as you say, I, I do believe it. We're, we're getting started here. But what are some of the learnings that you've taken over the last years in crypto? Um, and for, for any of the builders out there or just people in the community, like, you know, what, what, what kind of advice would you give them if you were to do this again and start DYDX today? Like, what are some of the things that you would... Um, you know, definitely not do or just or, or, or do. I'm just curious of general advice for, for builders and community members. Yeah, absolutely. The core piece of advice I would give anyone who's building in crypto is to be focused. And I think this is actually pretty hard to do in crypto because there's so many exciting things going on. Like there's a million things, you know, DYDX for the sake of argument could do like, I don't know, we could launch like an NFT exchange. We could, you know, launch spot trading, margin trading. Um, we could get more involved in like building products for our community, et cetera. But I think it's really important to, first of all, identify like a really big opportunity. And then second of all, focus on that, you know, maybe not exclusively, but at least with most of your focus. And I think especially that's important for any startup and in, in any vertical, but especially in crypto where it's so easy to get distracted by things. And it's like, I see just, just a lot of different teams trying to do like a million things at the same time at like an okay level. It's better to do one thing at like an amazing level than 20 things at like at a fine level. So that would be like the main piece of advice. Um, the second piece of advice maybe is obvious, but like build for the long term. Like think about how is your protocol or company going to be successful, not this year, but five years from now. And find people, um, employees, investors, advisors that are really long-term focused. And I think that is probably the best thing that we've done at DYDX so far. Like our goal, you know, since we were created has always been to become like the biggest crypto exchange, on, you know, when we started like in the next five to 10 years. And now you know, we're four years along that journey and it's like three to five years away. Um, but that's still our goal is to become the biggest exchange, you know, not this year, but like five years from now. And like, how do we build towards that? You know, it's important for us to keep growing towards that. Um, but I think a lot of people get, again, distracted by a lot of the short-term things that are going on in crypto and being able to identify what are the trends that are going to stand the test of time um, and like what is the best way to build your product or protocol to grow um, five to 10 years from now um, is, is a really important thing to focus on and not get too sidetracked with like, you know, juicing short-term metrics or like token price or like whatever people are into. Um, and the third thing, and I've talked a lot about this, and I always talk a lot about this, is be really product focused. Like that's just the way companies are successful, right? Just historically throughout like all of tech, you build the best possible product, you know, you do a lot of, it's not only about building products, like you still got to do a lot of good growth things to like grow that product. Um, but usually like the better products went out over time, or at least like solid products went out over time. And again, in crypto, um, it's a balance, right? Um, I think at UIDX, maybe we're too product focused. I don't know if that's just kind of the way I am. A lot of teams are also like really community focused. And I think that's important as well, but like you can't only be community focused. You have to have like strong product direction. You have to have like really strong engineering. You have to build for what's the best possible technology um, for three to five years from now, not even just this year. Um, and I think those three things are things that I find often lacking in a lot of like different like crypto projects um, and things that I think are pretty core to DYDX and that have served us well. Yeah. Well, Antonio, it's great having you on the show. Thanks for sharing your story and keep up the great work. Um, 
Where can people find you, you know, folks that may be interested in potentially applying for some roles or just learning more about the YDX? What's the best way to get a hold of you, the team, or just learn about the product? Yeah, absolutely. So best place is dydx.exchange. Our website has all of our job listings, Twitter, um, et cetera. I'm at Antonio M. Giuliano on Twitter. If you're interested in following some of my hot takes, um, <laughs> but um, feel free to reach out to, to me or anyone on the team anytime. Awesome. Well, Antonio, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate you taking the time and um, happy holidays. Uh, I know it's uh, sort of crunch time uh, and really appreciate you coming on. And so uh, thank you so much and keep up the great work. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm.